Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kareem Yagmore, and I will attempt to go through 60 slides in 50 minutes. <laughs> okay. That's right. <laughs> Been there, done that. Um, before I go anywhere, let me just uh, get a feel of the uh, room here. So just please re raise your hands for the following questions. Who's got any sort of embedded Linux experience? Cool. All right, that one's out the door. Uh, Android platform experience? Cool. Any people here played with Brillo? A couple. All right. Anybody played with Android Things? Cool. All right. You're probably at the right place. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> iOS, right? <laughs> okay. I will put these slides up afterwards. Um, you know, don't bother looking for them. They're not yet up. Okay. So, um, in case you don't know. Uh, my background, I wrote the embedded Linux book for O'Reilly uh, way back when, um, and a couple of years back, I wrote the embedded Android title, uh, most widely known for having written the Linux Trace Toolkit uh, and maintained it for a couple of years. Fortunately, uh, some other people, including Stephen here, have been doing a much better job than I was at uh, tracing, um, and it's in good hands. So uh, I'm happy not to take care of that anymore, and if you grip the kernel sources around, you'll find my name until somebody finds that what I wrote has bit rotted and then takes it away, which should eventually happen. Um, and whatever, you know, when I'm not, you know, doing these lectures and playing uh, with uh, funky stuff in uh, kernel and uh, Android and elsewhere, I'm helping customers do all sorts of weird things with, uh, with Android, which gets me into these kinds of interesting presentations. Um, I am not directly involved with Android things. I was, in a past life, involved in a modular phone project with Google. Um, but uh, uh, Android things is not one thing I'm... Um, participating in, which is cool because that means I can say whatever I want. <laughs> um, and so I will try to take this conversation into a different directions. So, um, you know, one obvious caveat is Google has not yet released the sources for Android things. So everything that you see here is really just based on my um, perusal of the binary releases that ha they have made. Um, and I will try to take a few minutes to just show you around and kind of point out differences with the mainstream Android and such. Okay, um, so let me start with just a bit of background here. So, um, and, and try to take this uh, out of the way quickly because uh, as I said, I've got plenty of stuff to show you. So uh, first off, if you try to define embedded Linux, the best I've come up with, even though I wrote a 400 page book on the thing, is that it's a set of ad hoc recipes for creating essentially a file system around the Linux kernel. I mean, that's pretty much you know, the, the thing that you can nail it down to. Um, and then you can say, well, there are some usual suspects. You know, usually you'll have U-Boot, usually you'll have BusyBox or whatever else that you care for, uh, the GNU tool chain and, and some other stuff like that. But um, usually it is up to the system designer to decide what goes into the Linux system. And obviously, um, people have created packages to make this simpler, Yocto, BuildRoot, you name it, okay? So um, when, say, um, I left the scene of embedded Linux in the mid 2000s to go pursue some startup that I was interested in. Um, the one thing that was lacking with embedded Linux was a serious U UX or UI. All right, there just wasn't anything out there that was the standard user interface. And um, Android kind of solved that to a very large extent. Okay, um, it, it is a very uh, rich environment, both for users and developers. And the nice thing that Google has done that was not possible in the embedded Linux world is they've standardized an API. Um, and they maintain that in time, and they maintain it in a coherent fashion. And if they have to essentially uh, uh, um, take some things out of the API, then they advertise that ahead of time, and then you know, kind of seamlessly walk people through to the exit, all right? Um, and they have made a number of interesting contributions to, um, say, the embedded world in general. ADB, I think, is my favorite. So um, you could do similar things than ADB before ADB with, say, SSH, but it's a bit heavy, all right? ADB kind of just makes it really simple. Here, I've got my, say, uh, Nexus 9 here plugged into my laptop over a USB cable, and I can shell into it with ADB shell, you know, some trivial stuff, okay? Um, and really, the, uh, you know, the, the key here is the development environment. It's really, really easy to get started with Android development. And there are a tremendous amount of developers out there. And um, I guess I don't need to necessarily show you this, but you know, kind of like just to market share, 
you know, of, of Android versus other stuff out there. It's just eating the entire pie. So people will counter argument and say, well, no, but Apple's actually making a lot more profits than these other, you know, whatever vendors. Okay, so what? You know, the number of devices out there that are running that specific operating system are way much more than anything else out there. Okay? Uh, by the way, I, I get better as I get questions. This is easy stuff, but you know, you're welcome to uh, interject at any point. <laughs> so this is a bit of a funny kind of picture I put together for a presentation I did at, in, <laughs> at the Android Builders Summit in 2012. Um, and I had uh, actually uh, headlined it with some uh, quotes from Quentin Tarantino. But uh, <laughs> um, interestingly, so the story behind this is before I made this talk, I had a customer come to me and say, hey, we'd like to run Android on a headless system. And at first I thought this was hilarious. I was like, really, seriously? If you want to run you know, a headless system, just forego Android, go with embedded Linux, it does the job. Um, and, and they said, no, 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 we, we, want, you know, we want to have Android. And I said, okay, well, explain that to me. So uh, there are two reasons that he wanted to go with Android. Uh, the first one was, um, they have multiple platforms. Some of them have a user interface, some of them don't, and they did not want to have to maintain three, four different operating systems. They wanted to standardize on a single operating system and use that as their core thing, which is pretty good. Um, and the other thing that he mentioned is that if he was going to use Android, then <clears throat> he could essentially um, get any app developer off the street and have them start coding for their embedded system without that developer needing to know anything about embedded. And those are you know, pretty compelling you know, arguments from a business perspective for adopting um, Android, even though you might not have an actual UI. Now, back at the time, there was nothing that Google was doing in this area. Okay? So you can go look at my slides. I kind of uh, went around and trimmed out the surface flinger, shut the window manager off, and played around with a bunch of things, you know, um, destroy the crap out of it. But it worked. Okay? I was able to get the thing to boot and actually start stuff. Okay? Now, um, six months later, I was doing a presentation at uh, Lenaro Connect Copenhagen remotely, and somebody in the crowd said, hey, have you checked out the RO config headless flag? I was like, no, I don't know what that is. Um, and so in, in, in the interim, between my first presentation and the second one, Google had, had come out with the Nexus Q, which maybe some of you don't recall, but it was this like spheric thing, which was a multimedia player. It didn't, wasn't really a big commercial success, but it was essentially running you know, some kind of form of a headless Android. So um, there was, at least starting at that point, you know, some interest within uh, Google to actually take a look at that. And um, that flag remained in the stack for a while. I, don't, I haven't checked recent versions if it's still there or not. Um, but you know, essentially what it did is it essentially disallowed you to start activities. You just couldn't start activities. You could do pretty much everything else but not activities. All right? Now at some point uh, later, they came out with Brillo. So um, they announced Brillo, and I was there at Google I.O., and they started showing me slides, like, oh, click, 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 what the heck's this? Um, and so, you know, they never really officially released it. Um, it was always just a, a developer preview, but they did put sources out, okay? So you could actually download this thing um, and, and start, you know, using it. And, and the way it worked is it actually um, was having applications stock through the house directly to the hardware, all right? So there was no, um, as I'll show you in a, in a, in a few slides here, um, traditional separation of privilege between applications and system services. It was just you know straight load the sensors, Hal, and start talking to your sensors if you want to do that, right? And then you can connect that over Weave to some cloud infrastructure. Um, and just late December, essentially, or mid-December, they announced Android Things, which is the successor to um, Brillo, and whereas I'll show you with Brillo, they kind of stripped away the entire system, and they only had kind of like the native layer. With things, they're bringing back everything again, all right, I including the privileged separation of applications from regards to system services and the core infrastructure, and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, you can still use C and C++ programming, but it is the standard route, which is, you know, NDK. So it's not, you know, kind of build your own thing into um, the AOSP or, <clears throat> or the bastardized AOSP. Uh, into your your uh, your thing. So, as I said, the sources aren't available, but you can get essentially images for a bunch of boards. So there are some from uh, the Raspberry Pi. There are some from for the Edison and two other uh, boards as well. Um, I've tried really hard to get it to work on the Raspberry Pi, and it kind of works, except I can't shell into it. So it's this is pretty useless. 
So the trouble with the Raspberry Pi, um, and it's not Google's fault, it's, it doesn't have an OTG port. So um, you really have to have, you know, follow the recipe they have there. Um, Intel's done a pretty good job with the Edison here. I can just plug it off the um, USB OTG and, and get myself a shell and that kind of stuff. All right. Okay, <clears throat> really quickly, since all of you have experience with this stuff, we're gonna go really fast here. Gray stuff is in C, other colored things is not in C. So <clears throat> in a classic embedded Linux system, I got a Linux kernel, a C library, some stuff in user space, mainly BusyBox, okay? Android looks a bit more like something like this, completely different from what you may know of other operating systems based on Linux. Um, Linux kernel, you know, uh, native layer, <clears throat> and then the bulk of the intelligence is in this stuff called the system services, and they have, in modern day Androids, about 100 or so system services. They keep adding half a dozen, say, every release or something like that. Um, and so any intelligence that goes on in the system really happens in those system services, okay? This is not the canonical diagram that you will find from Google. This is what I discovered by looking at the sources, and I feel you know, pretty confident that's what, what it looks like. But you, know, uh, you might have different opinions. So that's your you know, standard stack here. Your applications are running, in between your applications and your hardware, you have, you have about seven or eight different layers of software um, that are being crossed. Say, for example, you try to you know, get the sensors or camera or whatever. If you zigzag all through this, you're going through a lot of software, okay? And that's what they, as I'll show you in a bit, had taken away uh, with, uh, with Brillo. Now, uh, one of the key things to Android, and I'm not gonna go through this one in detail, you can watch some of my videos online, uh, is the binder mechanism. It's the IPC mechanism that holds Android together. It's essentially a driver that's in the kernel that does IPC, think of it in the sockets, but essentially for a local use only, all right? You have a name resolution service and that keeps all the glue together. Um, and the best way to look at this is actually look at a real live device. So let me show you what I've got, say, on my Nexus 9. So we've got this tool that's on, on our GitHub. You can go grab this, it's open source. We call this Binder Explorer. And what it does is it shows you all the system services on the periphery here and the actual applications in the middle. And the lines are actually the communication between the apps and the system services. So for example, I can hover over, say, I don't know, the window manager and see who's trying to talk to it, right? Um, and then I can click on the window manager and even get the interface for that actual system service. That's the AIDL in case you're familiar with, uh, with Android. Um, so as you can see, there's a vast amount of stuff happening here. And so for example, this guy here is the service manager, which is the name resolution service, so it's connected to everybody, okay? Um, so this is the best we've been able to come up with to give a snapshot or a you know, bird's eye view of, hey, what does my Android system look like? All right, what's in here, what's happening, okay? Um, and conversely, you can click on any of those apps and see who they're talking to and that kind of stuff, all right? <clears throat> so the system services that you see here, okay, um, there are about 100 or so, all right? They are uh, essentially running into, in, in, in a handful of processes. There, there isn't a process per system service. There, they happen to be, you know, say the system, ser the system server process, Surface Flinger, and a bunch of other guys. Um, and that really hasn't changed in, in say, Brillo and, 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 and so on. Another key property of Android is this concept of a HAL, hardware abstraction layer. They shove a bunch of stuff in user space. They had it away from, yeah, whatever, from the kernel, so to speak. Um, and then essentially the system services use those house to talk to hardware. That again is the same for, you know, uh, uh, Brillo and, and Android things and, and so on, okay? Um, so far so good? Not going too fast? All right, okay, cool. So uh, what does Brillo do? First off, Brillo actually comes off of work that had been done by apparently some people in the Chrome OS team. Because it was, in the beginning, it was really, really, really heavily tied to Dbus. The IPC was Dbus and everything was going over Dbus, all right? Eventually they scrapped that and they moved it over to, um, to, to Binder. And the one thing they did, which I thought, thought was really cool, was they actually added, um, so who's, uh, if you ever use the AIDL tool to generate uh, Java from uh, AIDL descriptions, uh, in the older days, it, it could just generate Java. And if you wanted to do C system services or C++ system services, you had to go and craft the AIDL stuff by hand to marshal the, you know, do switch cases and stuff like that. And so what the Brillo guys did is they actually added support for taking AIDL files and generating C++ code, and that's really cool. Um, and that's actually in, in seven, I think, in, 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 in the sources. So what Brillo did is it actually did away with everything, all right, the entire stack. And your apps were sitting essentially literally on top of the native layer. That's all you had, okay? Um, and what Weave does or did 
um, was essentially allow your device to be connected to, through the cloud to you know, applications that we're talking with, all right? And so you can get notifications straight from the device or through the cloud or whatever it is, okay? Um, and there are plenty of pointers in my press presentations if you wanna see the protocols of how that stuff works and so on and so forth. Um, the sources, the way it was laid out is when you wanted to get the sources, on, uh, there was a manifest file, but it was a different manifest file from Android and it was trimmed down, so what you would get was just these directories, which is a whole lot less than what you would get in standard Android. So stuff that went, was removed, for well, example, like art, you know, all the, art, all, all the Java stuff, all the Java stuff was com completely gone, all right? Um, SDK gone, so on and so forth. And if you'd looked at external, um, this is the stuff that they had removed from, from the AOSP. I mean, everything that's Java related was gone, all right? So there was just no Java environment whatsoever. Um, and in external, they added a handful of things. Again, you know, you can see the traces of Chrome kind of uh, being around, and the fact that Chrome also uses Gen 2 to build, uh, the Gen 2 build system to build itself, and, and so on and so forth. The interesting thing though, and that's really where I wanted to get to, um, is if you look at the size of the images, the Brillo image was about a tenth of the Android image. They're not equivalent architectures, okay, whatever, I'm cheating a bit, but you get the, you get the, you get the general idea here, okay? The Brillo image was about, you know, 150, 60 megs or so, uh, compared to, say, 1.x gigs for, for an actual system image for the AOSB, and that's pretty considerable, all right? And what I liked personally about Brillo is not, I mean, okay, so um, there's one thing I, 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 I wanna make clear here is, personally, I am looking at what Google is doing with this IoT stuff in a very selfish way. So I don't care about what their market goals are, and I, but I wish them best of luck. I mean, they're a really nice company and they're doing really cool stuff. But I'm looking at this from, from the perspective as, okay, I'm not necessarily looking for the branding. I don't really care being part of their ecosystem, but I really like to do embedded stuff and I wanna see what I can use from what they're doing, okay? And so one thing I really liked about Brillo uh, w was that it, they gave me a standard embedded Linux distribution that I could use to, you know, build stuff on without having to actually specify libraries and, you know, uh, recipes and stuff like that, okay? Um, in terms of user space, if you looked and you shelled into the device, so that's the, um, in the background, what you've got is the traditional file system layout for Android. And so they had stripped away, say for example, the apps and framework directories from the system, which are really kind of like the central thing where all the, the jars and, and apps are, are found. And they had kind of put the RAM disk and the system image together, which usually they're, they're kind of separate, okay? Kind of a bit of a detail. Um, they had a whole bunch of daemons they added, so, um, and this is gonna be a bit tiny here, but I'm just gonna read out some of them. So they had this shill thing, which actually comes from, from Chrome. This is how Chrome kind of distracts the uh, portals so that you can connect to the internet and that kind of stuff. Um, and they have WeaveD and WebServeD, so the way it works essentially is you get a connection to the WebServeD which hands it off to WeaveD and then hands it off to the applications. So in, in other words, your, uh, um, your uh, REST API was being handled here and then handed off to Weave which would then dispatch it to whoever had requested you know, handling for this kind of functionality or whatever for that device, okay? Um, Right, <laughs> which gets us to Android Things. So Android Things essentially just does away with most of what Brillo had taken away. It just brings, brings a lot of it back. Um, and the architecture is very much the same as we had before, except they've added a, few bunch, a bunch of bells and whistles here and there to cater for you know, the, um, the IoT nature of the, of the system. Um, now, the, we, okay, in the case of, oh, by the way, I'm sorry, I skipped one step. So just to give you an idea, remember this is my Nexus 9, all right, and this is a Brillo instance, okay? So you still have system services, but it really is a lot, you know, uh, smaller in terms of coverage uh, of, of, you know, system services and such. The service manager is always there. It's intrinsic to Binder. If you stop service manager, there's nothing running on the system, so. <laughs> um, all right, sorry, going back. So, um, how are we doing time? Okay, I, I need to speed up a bit. Okay, so, um, right, so Weave is no longer in the file system. Weave used to run straight off of um, the RC files in the case of, um, 
uh, in the case of, of Brillo. And um, as, as the folks from, from Intel mentioned earlier this morning, um, essentially that's being moved out as a separate component. The site is still on. So in other words, if you go to the URL where Weave is, it doesn't redirect you to things. It still has the standalone Weave site. Um, so that, for me, from my perspective, seems to be a still TBD in, in terms of releases and stuff like that. Um, they still use essentially the same concept of HALS. You, you, you essentially have the Android Studio platform, uh, development platform, all that kind of stuff, and you may or may not use display. That's up to you. So I mentioned those two boards. There's also the Jewel and the, um, the uh, NXP board that's there. So the one thing that for me, uh, from my embedded roots, um, really hurts my eyes is when I look at the RAM requirements for those boards. You know, it's like one gig of RAM, all right, three gigs of RAM. <laughs> you know, another gig of RAM is like, oh my God, we're, we're using this for embedded? <laughs> so that's, that's one thing that for me, you know, uh, is, is, is at the forefront of my mind when I look at these kinds of efforts, when we're looking at actually using, you know, boards um, that have this kind of firepower uh, for IoT capabilities. Now, it's not to say that, they're, they're, that they don't have their place, they do, but uh, what, I, what I'm trying to figure out is where, how do I bridge the gap here between something that is this powerful, okay, um, and needing something like this to just flip my lights on and off. I mean, that doesn't make much sense, all right? I mean, it is interesting for, for Google to put out examples that, that use this and breadboards to show people how they can blink lights and stuff, but I'm not deploying this all through my house to replace all my power, you know, uh, just to flip lights on and off. That ma makes no sense at all, all right? There has to be something that goes in between, and, and I'll get to that a bit later, all right? Um, okay, so what does things bring to the uh, foreground? And so this is my earlier diagram with the bits and pieces that come from Google uh, for Android things. I'm going to slow down here just a bit to kind of walk you through some of this stuff. <coughs> the peripheral I.O. how? Whenever Google adds support for a new kind of hardware, they add a definition for the how. All right? So if you're not familiar with this, let me just give you a really quick um, um, introduction to this stuff. So actually, let's go for this. Let's make this uh, bigger. And let me go into my, um, say, seven sources, okay? Uh, Flounder Eng, cool. So no apologies for, for those who use uh, VI. I'm an Emacs person. So um, if you go underneath hardware, lib hardware, include hardware, you've got all these header definitions. And any kind of hardware that you can think of that Android supports usually has a formal HAL definition in those headers that says the HAL module, which is de facto a SO file, has to provide these kinds of callbacks in order for the system service to be able to talk to the hardware. Now, if I go back to my diagram here, the thing that you need to understand about Android is Android does not care about what driver you're using in the kernel for GPS. It literally doesn't care. It doesn't even know it's there. All it cares about is it found, uh, you know, gps.fubar.so or whatever it is, or uh, any sort of, you know, HAL module that will then do the necessary talking to the actual driver underneath it, okay? So they've added, you know, a, um, sorry, going back to Emacs, wherever that is. There we go. They've added one for the peripheral I.O., okay? Now, the source is not being available. One wonders where we could get a version of that. So luckily, uh, peripheral manager actually existed in Brillo as well. So you do have the sources for that snapshot, which is a bit dated, but it's still there. So if I go out here and go to, let me just take this out of full screen and create a new window. Let's go to android.googlesource.com. So this is obviously, you know, where the repositories are. I'm going to go looking for peripheral manager. And so again, this is dated. So Probably not where they're shipping right now into Android things, but if you go underneath HAL uh, hardware peripheral IO.h, this is the HAL definition for uh, the peripheral IO, um, uh, so to speak, uh, module. All right. And if you go on the devices, so for example, I am shelled here, or I am not actually shelled, but give me a second, I will be. Uh, ADB, let's do this. Clear ADB devices. 
Oh, great. So I've used different server ver I'm Those of you who've played around with Android know what's going on. But anyway, it doesn't really matter. All right, let's shell back to this guy. So if I go, um, actually, let's do this first. Root. All right, if I go to system lib hw, I've got myself a peripheral IO edison.so. This is the Edison board here, okay? So that's the module that would be loaded by the peripheral manager to talk to the IO that's on that specific board. And you can actually see that by doing something really stupid here. You can do a look for peripheral manager uh, PID, do a cat proc 167 maps grep, uh, say just HW, there you go. And you can see that the um, HAL module that we've got here is loaded in the address space of that, um, that process, which is the peripheral IO manager, uh, which happens to be in C++, by the way. It's not um, actually in, in Java like other system services. So that's for, sorry, going, that's my HAL. The peripheral manager, I put it up there with the rest of the system services, but it is in C, it's not actually in Java. And then the, that system service has an EIDL which exposes its APIs and then there are classes that expose those APIs off to applications, all right? This is just, you know, that part here. Let me actually see if the highlighting works. No, it doesn't. Okay, let's try it this way. So, so this part here, that's just classic Android plumbing, okay? None of that is really revolutionary, okay? The interesting thing is they've replaced actually the bulk of the standard applications with this, with this thing called IoT Launcher. In fact, there's an IoT Launcher APK. Um, and th that um, IoT Launcher uh, uh, is, a, again, I don't have the sources, but it seems to be the party that actually starts off the default application, uh, Android Things application that you would create, which would have its own set of intents, which are slightly different from the home application. They also have this, I mean, these, so look, looking at the right, the right hand two boxes on the top there, um, they have um, this concept of user space drivers and also this peripheral driver library. And very honestly, I find this very confusing, like the distinction they're making here. So the idea is there are some system services who could benefit from input coming in from your custom hardware. So sensors, GPS, user input, okay? And so they have the, an API that allows your applications to feed events off to the system services. Like, okay, here's a GPS location, here's a you know, key press, here's whatever, okay? But they also have in user space this thing they call a library, which um, you know, if you've ever used any capes, right, on, on these boards or, or any kind of like, hard, uh, like whatever, like you plugged in an LCD off to an Arduino, right? The way to control those LCDs or buttons or so on, it can be involved. So what they did is they wrapped around some of the stuff or some of these components into libraries. And then you can call into that once you plug it into that, uh, into the board, instead of actually having to manually say manage the LCD panel. And they've called this a peripheral driver library. And they have examples of that on, on, on GitHub. Um, but from my perspective, that's still a user space library. So whatever, whatever. Uh, there's some kind of name confusion there going on. Um, any questions thus far? We're good? All right. In terms of image sizes, so bringing back some of the stuff I had before and adding, say, the Raspberry Pi and Edison uh, images, uh, we're not in the realm of Brillo, which was, as I said earlier, about 160 megs. We are, say, 2, 2.5 times that size, but we're still not, you know, in the 1.x gig range. So we've trimmed down the size quite a bit still, maybe a third of the original image size uh, in, terms of the, uh, in terms of storage, okay? Which is, which is not too bad. I mean, it, given that, you know, keep in mind that you've got the full AOSP underneath, underneath your feet here, okay? This is the full thing. It's not, you know, this trimmed down image with just a bunch of native libraries. Okay, um, as I said, the user space is mostly the same. In fact, uh, if we just go back to my uh, Edison here for a second, let me just uh, give you a really quick tour here. If I go to the top level, uh, this is actually, let's do this. Uh, um, so this is my, you know, OCD playing. There we go. Okay, so the file system layout, 
pretty much the same as a standard AOSP. If I would shell into an AOSP, I would find pretty much the same kind of stuff, all right? Um, you need to get prop, you get all the properties. Um, I mean, this, the, the layout is pretty much the same, okay? I'm not gonna waste your time walking you through the details of how Android works, but that's pretty much what you've got. So you got here, you know, product name, model. Uh, interestingly, this uh, is marked out as, I believe, 7.0. So this is, uh, this is an actually 7.0 based tree. So presumably they will merge that back. Um, either in 7.0 or 8x, I, I, I don't know, I have no idea. Um, what else do I wanna say here? Yeah, um, okay, if you, if you look at the list of processes for a second, sorry. So most of the stuff that's here looks like Android, um, to a few exceptions. So uh, they have obviously the peripheral manager, which I mentioned before. You, you still have Surface Flinger in there, um, audio server and that kind of stuff. Um, and some of the apps are there, uh, but key ones are not. So there is no status bar application, all right? Um, although you still have, and although you still have a, uh, or is it again? I believe I saw the settings um, app running here before. Okay, I can't see it anymore. Um, I saw the settings app running, but the, the, the actual content, pro the settings content provider is not there um, anymore. Um, what else do I want to point out here? Yeah, this is the IoT launcher I mentioned to you, uh, which is essentially the, uh, the main starting point for, uh, for Android things. Oh, sorry. So peripheral man I mentioned, oh yeah, you can actually do a dump sys on the peripheral manager, which is not too bad. So uh, if you're not familiar with dump sys, it's a way to actually get, um, so if I do this service list, so remember that, that uh, binder explorer I showed you, which all showed you all the system services as a, as a, as a kind of like a, you know, a Star Wars formation. <laughs> um, you can do a service list and see them on the command line and the peripheral manager happens to be one of those. So if I do something like this, perif, and I do, uh, no, sorry, it's, uh, this will help. There we go. And if I do a dump sys on this guy here, that, it will tell me, you know, the um, actual um, pins that are laid out for what kind of purpose, so GPIO, I square C, and so on and so forth, which is not too bad. Um, and if you use some of the traditional ones, so if you do something like dump sys GFX info, so you can see out here that actually almost nobody's got any surfaces. So these uh, view root impulse would correspond to an actual activity. Um, and you'll see that they're mostly zero except Except, except, uh, this is, uh, so IoT Launcher, which actually if you plug this to a monitor, you will see an actual display of, you know, this is Android things. Um, and the key guard, I'm not sure why this is actually running a, a Surface, but whatever. Um, so the HALs I mentioned, the SO I mentioned. Um, all right, the APIs. Um, so if you go to the things um, web address, you will find the actual um, APIs that they have available for developers. So um, I'm not sure whether you can see this pretty clear in the back, but you know, GPIO, I square C, PWM, so on and so forth. Cool. Um, and this is the user driver classes which correspond to the user driver box that I had in my earlier diagram. All righty. Um, oh yeah, there was one thing I wanted to kind of show you, I think, oh no, I got it down further down. There we go. Um, I told you about IoT Launcher. So IoT Launcher, interestingly, if you do something like this, uh, so where's my APK? I have this somewhere on my desktop. Just give me a second here. So if I do this, and let's make it bigger. Uh, things, binaries from Edison. So I've been playing around here. So if I do an AAPT, L and then dash, oops, why does he keep coming back to this guy? Ah, he's full screen, there we go, off you go. Um, sorry, L dash, oh, he's full screen now, cool. Dash A I O T launcher APK. So this is essentially just dumping the uh, manifest file of the APK. You'll see that it's still got category launcher um, uh, and category home. So these are actually the intents that you would actually need to use to, uh, to get yourself a home screen. So in other words, the stack 
um, the internals of the system services, or at least for the activity managers, doesn't seem to have changed. The activity manager is still sending the same intent as before, except it's being caught by IoT launcher instead of being caught by launcher x.apk, whatever that is, uh, uh, would be the default in, uh, inside Android. Um, if you look at the spec for uh, how you write an Android Things app, you will see that actually they tell you uh, to use a, a different actual um, launcher. It's IoT launcher, I think, is the intent to, to make your uh, IoT application kick in. Um, and I believe that it's probably that that does the actual sending of that IoT launcher intent, because if you do a strings you, the, from the GNU tool chain, right, and you look around for that in the, in the ODEX file, because it's compiled, um, you will find that in there. Okay, so I mentioned status bar is gone, blah, blah, blah. I showed you the GFX info, which gets me to the last part of my presentation, which is essentially, you know, um, where is this IoT stuff taking us? Because as I said, you know, this RAM stuff, you know, is, is pretty, pretty intensive, okay? So this might seem like a segue, but you'll see it comes back to, to the original topic. So this. <laughs> Once upon a time, I was involved in the modular phone project. So uh, aside from being super cool, there were a few things that we did in ARA that, that are still um, very interesting, okay? So the architecture that ARA had was that you had a application processor. This is like you know, your bleeding edge you know, SOC, whatever it is, okay? Um, talking to a switch, all right, two modules on the other side, okay? So this is the Unipro bus, and I'm not going to delve into that, whatever, you can look that up. Uh, essentially, since the modern ASOCs do not talk Unipro, what we had was this thing called the AP bridge, and what it did is we would plug it into the uh, USB, say, HSIC, and it would take that and convert it over to Unipro. And on the other side, a module would take, we'd have a GP bridge, which would take that traffic and convert it into I2C, PWM, GPIO, standard stuff, okay? That's the hardware side of it. And a module would look something like that. It would have an interface, which would have C ports. C ports are like sockets, so you could have a module with, say, a camera and storage, and you know, that would have a, its, own C, its, its own interface, and the other thing would have another interface, and that kind of stuff, all right? The software architecture, at least initially, looked something like this. So on the Android side, uh, we had these HALs, we had these user line drivers um, talking through the kernel off to modules on the other side, okay? Um, all of it layered on top of the hardware, which I just mentioned a second ago, all right? Out of this work came Graybus, all right? Which has been merged last I checked, I think. And so what does Graybus do? So Graybus does two things. First, it defines essentially um, class drivers. And this is like USB. If you're a USB storage device, it doesn't really matter what you are. Insofar as you conform to USB storage, the USB storage driver can talk to you, right? Same concept here for Graybus. If you are a Graybus conformant um, camera, you would be able to talk to that camera no matter what the module theoretically was, okay? And it also had, interestingly, interestingly, this, bridged by protocols. So in other words, you could have an application on Android talking I2C straight off to the I2C bus on the other side of the module, right? Um, and the stack was none the wiser. It was all tunneled over Graybus, okay? Um, which gave us something a bit like this. So, um, and that's just, this actually is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm stealing this from, from Greg Cage. <laughs> so, um, essentially, if I was trying to talk I2C, all right, I would go into the I2C subsystem, sorry, which would be tunneled over the Graybus core, going to the AP bridge host controller off to the uh, USB subsystem, because we're tunneling Unipro over USB uh, in, in that design, and this goes off to the actual module on the other side, all right? On the software side, um, the, uh, and these are all public slides that I had in my previous presentation, so none of this is really confidential. Um, if you were trying to talk to an I2C device, you would talk to the I2C manager. You would get yourself essentially a, um, a link to that thing, and off it would go, all right? So how does that have anything to do with Android things? 
So this brings me to this presentation by Alexandre Bayon um, at ELC Berlin last fall, okay? So um, I strongly encourage you to look this up. I mean, is this, I mean, uh, uh, um, Okay, no offense to anybody doing presentations at conferences, but I go to a lot of conferences and there are very, very uh, often it's stuff that I've seen before. In this case, it was like, wow, that's really neat. I've not seen this before. So what Alexandre set out to do is to actually take Graybus and remove the Unipro stuff and put essentially just IoT underneath it, okay? And so I'm stealing this, this slide from, from his presentation. So the way he laid it out, was to essentially have, you know, um, this is your, say, Linux host, all right? Talking over BLE to some microcontroller on the other side that is gray bus enabled, all right? And in that fashion, right, the gray bus tunneling capabilities make it such that I can control something that is remote, right, straight from my gray bus host, okay? And what I personally would like to see is something like this, where essentially you've got your Android things layered on top of Graybus on a you know, phone grade hardware kind of device, talking to MCU enabled devices that are all talking Graybus, because that would be really cool, right? And that would do away with my you know, kind of knee jerking reaction of, oh my God, I've got a gig of RAM on this thing. <laughs> Right, so the Giga RAM becomes justifiable, right? Because this device here then becomes not only itself a IoT device, but it also becomes an IoT gateway. And then essentially I can use all of the Android Things APIs that are given to me, and I can control these MCUs all over the place um, with the code that's running on this guy. All the other things that are connected to it only need to talk or speak Graybus, all right? And, that, and, and this is not too far-fetched, I mean, this, the, the, most of the groundwork has, has already been done by the gray bus stuff. So it's a matter of obviously, you know, um, making it, uh, if nothing else, just getting a, a, a say gray bus stack on Zephyr or whatever else that, 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 that you want to decide to, to put it on. But if we can pull this off, this can be very, very interesting. All right. And so this connects back to my, the, the, one of the first things I said about, about my interest in, in what Google does is, you know, is it's very much, you know, uh, self-centered, like, what could I do with this? <laughs> you know, and, and this is one thing that I would definitely see myself uh, doing because, you know, at some point in time, you know, okay, Google continues to maintain Android things. Um, they will eventually use a kernel that has Graybus support inside of it. And then the question will be, okay, what if I turn that on and then have the stuff on the other side actually responding to this Graybus traffic? All right? So, um, that's, so again, I encourage you to go look that, that presentation up. But um, that's pretty much my, my take on, on Android things. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to take them at this point. Yes, sir. How, how what? Hmm. Okay, so how would we fit into this picture? Um, okay, well, first of all, just one, one thing I want to correct. So um, the, the suggestion from, from Alexander was to use BLE. It could be anything from my perspective. You know, just imagine some kind of networking fabric. It doesn't really matter. Um, but how does Weave fit in all this? Uh, Weave can still run on my Android Things device. I mean, it's pretty cool, right? Whatever. It, it, just, it can still talk Weave on the other side. And then on the, other, on, on the, the device stuff, talk Graybus. I mean, that's perfectly fine. It doesn't really, I mean, the fact that my Graybus enabled MCU on the side here is not physically connected to this makes, should make no difference insofar as this advertises that device over to whatever it has to be advertised to. From a security standpoint, what does this mean? Because Graybus assumes a local, so, protected hardware network. Yes, perfectly, perfectly legitimate question. What about security? Um, and so <laughs> we, we've had a lot of discussions about Graybus in general uh, in terms of security. But yes, this is something that you, you have to care for. Um, but there are lightweight security mechanisms that can be deployed for, you know. So you lay something over top of Graybus is what you're saying? 
underneath. 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 So you would run, you would, so okay, it's not the proper, you know, kind of comparison, but imagine you've got SSL underneath Graybus, right? Um, or, or, you know, some similar secure communication mechanism with your MCU enabled gizmo on the other side. Yes, sir? Sorry? Latency. <laughs> Yes, a lot of a lot of the stuff is is time sensitive. I'm with you on that. Um, uh, you know that was uh, that is definitely something that that you would have to to keep in mind in doing those things. But it's not, from my perspective, uh, insurmountable if you've got the proper you know networking uh, connection to your to your host. Um, so yeah, yes, there is a cost to pay for that. The the the, the devices would have to tolerate those those. Uh, those latencies or have the fast enough connection to deal with them. How, okay, that's a very good question. And I, I would have hoped that Alexander would have been here to answer that one, but I, so the question is, you know, um, how lightweight is Graybus or how can you fit that onto a, a, an MCU? Um, so Alexander actually looked at, into that a lot more than I have, so I, uh, I, I, I can't answer it directly myself. Yes, sir. Oh. Oh. Yeah. So what's the adoption like for Android things? Right now it's a developer preview. So they're really just looking for, for and, and they kind of literally say in their documentation, you know, we're, we're looking for early adopters, people that want to play with it. Um, it. They're not yet ready to push it full, you know, full-fledged to developers. So it, the, I, we can't really say today what the success will or will not be for, for, for that. Yeah, but you want to find yourself behind it somehow in a year. Yeah. Right? Well, they, they do, I mean, they do seem to, at least from the documentation I've been able to see, they do encourage uh, vendors to get in touch with them and, and participate as a vendor. Um, no, can you, can you run Android things on a random custom device? No. You, the only thing that Google puts out is images for specific boards, which are the ones I showed earlier. So you, you can, I can't take that and say run it on, I don't know, uh, one of those ship $9 computers, right? Um, that's, that's not happening because the sources aren't there. Sorry? The manufacturer, the, the manufacturer has to have a BSP, right? I mean, you could play around with stuff. I mean, you could grab the images off of some of this stuff and repackage it with the custom built sources of uh, AOSP, but it's, sorry? If you have a different hardware, you have to get in touch with them to, to participate as, as one of the vendors, as in Google, correct, yes. A lot of that has to do with security, right? And the hardware up. They do provide security chain. I mean, so, so the thing with IoT and, and the, the folks from Intel did a fine job at, at kind of explaining this a bit earlier is, is you know, the, the issue is the updates, right? I mean, you have millions of devices in the field. Somebody somewhere is going to have to maintain them. And so Google actually seems to want to actually pr actively participate in making that happen. And that I think should be welcome, generally speaking. Obviously, you can always take the angle of, oh, evil corporation can do bad stuff. But generally speaking, I think, you know, they're trying to take the responsible, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, task of, of making sure devices are up to date. Yes, sir. The uh, things here. Yep. It's more like a hub, right? Sorry? Uh, in your layout over here, yep. Android things is more like an Android things hub. Um, Correct. So, yeah, I mean, in, in, in my proposed layout here is the Android things kind of act, acting as a hub. Uh, yeah, so it's, a, you know, could I be acting a dual purpose as an IoT gateway and as well have stuff directly connected to it. I mean, this layout doesn't preclude me having hardware directly connected into this box. But the idea is, you know, this is a fairly powerful piece of machinery, right? You know, flipping lights on and off just with this directly, I mean, that's overkill. Right, but if this thing was talking over to some kind of just really simple RF mechanism to turn my lights on and off with an MCU on the other side, that's a win. I was just wondering if there's a redefinition of what a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. 
Yes, sir. Correct. Yes. Uh, totally. I mean, so so uh, th this this thing, uh, this layout that I've got here, doesn't actually require Android things. But I think where really it becomes compelling is by the addition of Android things, you get all these APIs that Google gives you, uh, and and that I think should not be discounted. So Graybus could be used, and in fact that was the purpose of uh, Alexandra's uh, presentation. You could use this as a general purpose IoT thing for controlling devices remotely, um, but you're still stuck with okay, what's my API? <coughs> All right. Thank. Oh, yeah. Please. Thank you. Oh, oh. Thank you. All right. Thanks, folks, and um, have a good end of conference.